Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, wholesale diesel prices are at a two-year low. Book now to save money. Mississippi soybean growers find out when to turn off their irrigation at the turn row talks. In southern gardening, the hardy hibiscus. These can stand the cold and boast big flowers. In the food factor, we'll have some tips on choosing a breakfast cereal. In the markets, the new supply demand report is expected to keep the pressure on soybean prices as volatility kicks up in the cattle sector. Some traders think herd expansion is right around the corner. In the feature segment, a Mississippi farm which focuses on grass-fed, naturally raised beef. Sonnington Farm is selling its beef in local stores, restaurants, and through the internet. And contrary to uh, what a lot of people might think is that the flavor of the beef is gamey, that is just not true. If, if you raise your grass-fed cattle on good pastures, you're going to get a very flavorful beef. In fact, there's some studies that show that people chose grass-fed flavor over grain-fed flavor. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Growers are being urged to take advantage of the present drop in diesel. Artis wholesale diesel prices in the United States are at a two year low according to Farm Futures Magazine. A combination of factors are responsible, including high output from U.S. refineries and weaker global demand for crude oil. Farm Futures says the Group 3 wholesale price is below 275 per gallon. The magazine's energy writer, Bryce Knorr, recommends growers cover their needs through the fall. Turning to 2015, he recommends booking one-third of their spring needs at this time. Well, Mississippi soybeans are in the home stretch of the growing season. For many farmers, the most immediate question at this time is when do I stop irrigating my soybeans? The Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Mississippi Soybean Promotion Board recently held a series of turn row talks around the Delta. Farm Week's Zach Ashmore reports the talks gave growers guidelines on when to turn off the tap. Extension service specialists met with soybean farmers at several locations in the Delta to discuss when to stop watering the 2014 crop. Extension irrigation specialist Jason Krutz told producers there are two factors that give you the answer to the question, the maturity of the soybean crop and the amount of moisture in the soil. Uh, what we're looking for, most of our soybeans in the Mississippi Delta are indeterminate soybeans. So for those, we look in the upper four nodes only, and we want all the pods to be pretty much at 6.5, which would mean that they'd easily separate from that little protective membrane inside the pod. And then we'll couple that plant physiology data with soil moisture data. Krutz tells farmers that moisture sensors are a necessary tool in order to get the moisture data. Sensors permanently installed at 6, 12, and 24 inches in a field are preferred. However, a portable meter can also provide this information. Crute says not following the recommendation about maturity and moisture can result in a soybean farmer making two common mistakes at this time of year. Either they'll send an irrigation down the field when it's not needed, which would mean that they send an irrigation after 6.5 in those upper four nodes, and then we also see them terminate when we would say that it's not even at R6 yet, so the pods, uh, the beans in the pod have not uh, really started to touch and compress upon each other in the wall. The turn row talks on when to stop watering for the season are part of the Soybean Promotion Board's sustainable irrigation project known as the SIP initiative. It's a long-term effort to promote water conservation. From Stoneville, Mississippi, I'm Zach Ashmore reporting. It's been said breakfast is the most important meal of the day. On this episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State Extension Service gives us insight on choosing a good breakfast cereal.
Choosing a breakfast cereal for each family member can be difficult for so many reasons. There's variety, cost, and taste preference of each family member. Is it necessary to leave the store with so many kinds of cereal just to make everyone happy? When deciding what cereal to buy, take a look at the nutrition facts label. A low sugar cereal contains no more than four grams of sugar per serving. That equals to about one teaspoon per serving. Pay attention to the ingredients list. Look for whole grains listed as the first or second ingredient. Whole grains provided needed fiber for proper digestion. They also help lower your risk for diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and obesity. Many high sugar cereals are placed right at children's eye level in the grocery store. Don't think this placement is unintentional. Grocery stores place their products strategically to put it in eyesight of the consumer they are advertising to. Set a good example for your kids and avoid those high sugar cereals. By adding low fat milk and fruit to your cereal, you can have a healthy breakfast from three food groups all bundled into one. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Do you want some tropical color in your garden but you're afraid of cold temperatures? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us about a colorful hibiscus that can handle our Mississippi winters. Hibiscus are one of those must-have summer plants that we count on to brighten up our gardens and landscapes. Today we're visiting the Mississippi State Trial Gardens, taking a look at their gorgeous hardy hibiscus. Hardy hibiscus are very different from tropical hibiscus. First, these plants are winter hardy, having been bred from the native hibiscus found in the swamps and ditches of the Gulf Coast. And second, hardy hibiscus doesn't offer the shiny, glossy leaves of tropical hibiscus. But a trait the two varieties certainly share are the bright, beautiful, and almost gaudy flowers. The flowers of hardy hibiscus are huge, sometimes up to 12 inches across. In fact, they're often called dinner plate hibiscus. Just look at this deep burgundy flower of the cranberry crush hibiscus. The large, sheer petals draw your attention inward to the delicate pistil and stamen structure. Sultry Kiss Hibiscus features pretty pink flowers, contrasted next to the lobed burgundy foliage. Peppermint Flare Flowers emerge light pink and mature to white except for wild red flecking throughout the petals. The blossoms of Berrylicious are a delicious looking lavender rose with a deep strawberry red eye and attractive ruffled petals. Another type of hardy hibiscus is the native coccinius, also called Texas star. But instead of offering a dinner plate flower, this tall plant features striking six inch red flowers that actually resemble a star. So if you're ready to feast on a dinner plate of gaudy color, take a look at some of the different varieties of hardy hibiscus. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. The hardy hibiscus will thrive in USDA plant zones four through nine with minimal winter protection. In our feature segment today, Stonington Farm of Perkinston, Mississippi. This farm produces certified grass-fed beef, which it sells to restaurants, grocery stores, and through the internet. Time now for the markets with Layton and updated crop numbers are out from the USDA. Before the Thursday midday release, many traders spent this week tweaking their positions in the markets. Also in our headlines, the theory that global demand may pick up this year and stabilize soybean futures prices. The trade was expecting a production cut in the U.S. cotton crop in the new reports. And in dairy, cash butter prices jumped this week as supplies languish. As the U.S. soybean crop gets bigger, futures prices turn lower. Analyst Darren Newsom says the November contract is now dipping below $10. However, unlike some traders, he believes global demand will step in to save the day, so to speak. Once we start to get harvest going, you know, again, very similar to corn, we've got this record production supposed to be coming. That could be enough to push the November futures down below $10, possibly to $9.90, maybe to $9.30. After that, I think, again, global demand is going to step in, start to stabilize the market, and we could start to turn the corner back higher. 
Ahead of the new reports, a number of analysts were looking for fewer bales of cotton in the updated U.S. production figure for this fall. On Thursday, Extension Ag economist John Michael Riley weighed in with his analysis of the cotton market. John Michael, it seemed like a lot of the trade was expecting a cut in production in this new report. Did that materialize? It sure did. We're just getting the information in, so we'll be looking down quite a bit. But uh, 16.5 million bales of production projected for this year. That's based on 9.9 uh, 9 .9 million acres harvested. And they reduced, the, they reduced both the acres harvested and the yield for, uh, for the nation. Uh, yield is currently projected at 803 pounds an acre, down from 820 last month. So uh, a general reduction both in eight harvested acres and, and yield has led us to a, a 16 and a half million bale uh, production number. You carry that through uh, 5.2 million bales of ending stocks, which is lower than last month. I think we we're expecting a lower uh, ending stock number, but it's even below those pre-report expectations. So we're seeing a bit of a positive bump in the market, but uh, if you look, you know, if you keep tracking this, December's already down a little bit uh, compared to yesterday. It seems like it's a, a buy the rumor, sell the fact day right now. And uh, it did seem like leading up to this report on Thursday morning, that Thursday at midday, that uh, the market did rally a little bit, or it seemed to kind of get a positive flow before before the coming into the report for right, sure. Are the two right. things in play, obviously, the report number one, some some uh, pre-report trading, but also we've seen the dollar trending lower uh, yesterday and today, which is, has helped. Uh, ensure you know that the cotton prices worldwide should be uh, a little bit cheaper. Uh, that's kind of in the face of what's been going on the more a little bit more histor history there. Uh, dollar the do index do the dollar value has been increasing for the past number of days, which has been uh, adversely affecting cotton prices. But we have seen that change just yesterday and today. Now Thursday morning we also had a, uh, the weekly export sales report, and that uh, we saw some cancellations in that for cotton. That, that's correct. We've been seeing that as a result of this dollar impact, and of course, that's not imp uh, that's not being uh, predicted in the the World Ag Supply and Demand Estimates report because uh, that information is based on August uh, information as of uh, excuse me September first. So some of this newer uh, information is probably not uh, reflected in this report. And the carryout, uh, we could see a three or four year high in the cotton carryout for this year. Yes, indeed. Just higher. Still, we've at the end of the day, compared to last year, we're at higher acres and uh, roughly equal production or yield per acre. So uh, it, we should most uh, most likely will continue to see a higher uh, ending stock number for this year. It's National Rice Month, and we have a trivia quiz about this important crop for the state. And here's the question for you: How does Mississippi rank nationally in rice production? Is the answer A, number two, or B, number four, C, number six, or D, number eight? I'll tell you at the end of the markets. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span reports that the nation's beef herd should grow in the future while the demand for butter is exploding. In the feature segment today, Stonington Farm of Perkinston, Mississippi. It grows only grass-fed beef and it's finding customers for its cuts. Each year, many Mississippians are seriously injured or killed when farm tractors overturn. One cause of these accidents is improper hitching. If a tractor is hitched at any point above the drawbar, it can flip over backwards. Never hitch a tractor using the bar between the three-point hitch upper and lower links or at the top link attachment point. The stationary drawbar is the only safe location for tractor hitching. A message from the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Well, before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. The 24th annual rice tasting luncheon takes place on Friday, September 19th. That will be hours or 9 a.m., excuse me, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. The location is the Sillers Coliseum at Delta State University in Cleveland. 1,000 people are expected to enjoy more than 300 kinds of rice dishes. The Mid-South Forestry Equipment Show is Friday and Saturday, September 19th and 20th. The location is the Mississippi State University Star Memorial Forest. That's south of Starkville. Hours are 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Admission at the gate is $20. It's the South's premier logging show where the equipment is actually demonstrated. The 41st annual Horticulture Field Day, Ornamental Horticulture Field Day, is set for Poplarville. That's Thursday, October 2nd. Location is the South Mississippi Branch Experiment Station of Mississippi State University on West North Street. The hours are 9 a.m. to lunch. Lunch is included in your $10 registration fee. Variety trials, pest management, and the All-American Selections Trial Garden are just a few of the stops on the tours. 
Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. A trace of renewed volatility has been seen the past week in the U.S. cattle markets. Many traders do seem to be thinking that the nation's herd should start to grow, and that's because they are reportedly seeing the start of heifer retention. Here's analyst Don Roos. We are retaining heifers, and that's the one thing that is happening. And that is, that's the final phase of a bull market, is when you start to uh, hold back, retain some heifers. Um, the same thing with the, uh, the cow slaughter's been down. Those are both signs, and that's, what, that's been the signal of the market. And it's just we've had droughts in different areas that's held this off, uh, high-priced grain. Now we're here, good grass conditions in a lot of areas. I know not in California, but in a lot of other areas, the grass conditions have really improved. It's seldom that we speak of the butter market in this segment, but roaring demand has it in the spotlight. Cash butter closed at a record level, just under $3 per pound on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Reportedly, the September 5th dairy market news sparked this market rally. That report says that demand continues to outpace butter supplies, with the biggest demand period right around the corner in the fourth quarter. Meanwhile, the USDA reports that total cheese production during July topped 950 million pounds. Now that is an increase of 7% on the year. Production of the American variety of cheese alone was over 9% higher than one year ago in July 2013. Before our feature story, let's check the trivia answer for this week. The correct choice is C. Mississippi ranks number six in U.S. rice production. And our feature segment today, Stonington Farm of Perkinston, Mississippi. It's tapped into a niche market by providing grass-fed beef to stores, restaurants, and online customers. With help from the Mississippi State University Extension Service, the farm has developed a system based on what it calls responsible family farming. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports. At first glance, Donnington Farm in Perkinston, Mississippi doesn't look much different from most well-managed cattle operations, but many aspects of the farm might surprise you. For example, the owner, Michael Stonnington, isn't only a cattle farmer. He's also an orthopedic surgeon who served in the United States Air Force, finishing at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Stonnington was actually born in Australia, and when he was a young child, his father's medical career brought the family to the U.S. Fast forwarding to present day, Dr. Stonnington is now a surgeon and partner at Hattiesburg Bone and Joint who can talk cattle with his patients. When they first meet me, and, and if they don't know anything about me, um, they assume that, uh, that I, uh, I have a farm and then I just visit it every now and then. And then when they find out that I uh, actually uh, live on the farm and, and it's a working farm, um, they, uh, they're, they're quite shocked. And, uh, um, but generally, uh, most of my patients know that I'm a, a cattle farmer. We talk about the techniques we use to, to get the most uh, out of our grass. And, uh, um, and we also talk about uh, what kind of cows we have and, and why we like one over the other. Dr. Stonnington decided to begin cattle farming after Hurricane Katrina destroyed all the timber on the property. To the casual observer, it seems simple to just clear out the fallen trees, grow some grass, and add cattle. But there's much more to the process, and that's where Mississippi State University Extension Service agent Brad Jones comes in. I guess the main thing that I feel like we've been able to help the Stoningtons a lot with the last few years, you know, they've taken a lot of this place that was in pine trees and they've cleared it out, got it back in the pasture and are trying to do a proper job maintaining their fertilization programs, uh, being under weed control, making their own hay in the summertime. And, and we've made a lot of recommendations to help make those programs more efficient with them. Uh, spend a lot of time with them going over their soil sample results, doing some weed ID and discussing with them some uh, spray programs to help control those areas. Furthermore, Jones says Mississippi is blessed with healthy, nutritious forages, so raising grass-fed beef is encouraged. Dr. Stonington says lots of research generated the decision to exclusively feed grass, and he's happy with the results. The health benefits are, I think, unquestionable. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that grass-fed cows, they have a, a fat content that is a much more healthy profile. They have higher omega-3 fatty acids. They have higher uh, conjugated linoleic acid, which is CLA you might read about in, in, uh, in articles. Um, and those are, they can be uh, heart healthy 
and uh, help prevent disease. Uh, the, um, the vitamin profile in the beef is, is better. Um, and it's very similar in fat content to chicken breasts. And, uh, and contrary to uh, what a lot of people might think is that the flavor of the beef is gamey, that is just not true. If, if you raise your grass-fed cattle on good pastures, you're going to get a very flavorful beef. In fact, there's some studies that show that people chose grass-fed flavor over grain-fed flavor. Dr. Stonington says his medical background is instrumental in managing a healthy herd, and he does his best to use natural methods. We do use vaccines and um, do use wormers, um, but we don't use any antibiotics. And that's, that's why we're natural. Natural meaning that I do use certain things that I think are important for the health of the animal. If an animal is sick um, and I've determined that they do need an antibiotic, then that animal is treated because I don't want an animal to suffer. So that animal will be treated with an antibiotic, but then it's going to be culled from the program. Furthermore, extension agent Brad Jones says using forage-based systems can bring economic benefits to producers like Dr. Stonington. That's a niche market that we see a lot of growth in the last few years uh, as, as we see more urbanization, I guess is a proper word, in Hattiesburg and uh, along our coastal areas, along the Mississippi coast, uh, New Orleans and Mobile, we're, we're a close tie to all those areas. And, and there is a niche market there that, that really seems to be growing. And, and if it's there, so we need to be capitalizing on that as farmers. There, there's some uh, premiums to be seen. In addition, Dr. Stonington talks about where you can find Stonington farm products. We market uh, through Corner Market, which is a uh, grocery store uh, in uh, Hattiesburg area. And it's fresh. It's not been frozen. It's been dry aged for two weeks. We do all cuts. We have an internet website, stoningtonfarm.com. On that site, it tells how we, we market to individuals, and, and the individuals get all the cuts as well. And it's a vacuum packed, and, uh, and a vacuum packing that we use can actually last up to two years in the freezer and, and um, 21 days in the refrigerator. In addition to Corner Market, Stonington Burgers are on the restaurant menu at Keg and Barrel in Hattiesburg, and products have been available at Purple Parrot and the Hattiesburg Train Depot for special events. Dr. Stonington's wife, Katie, manages the marketing and business end. I've learned to appreciate salespeople that need to go out and try to push whatever product they have because you've got nothing to really go on until you're established. And I think the turning point was getting our meat in the Corner Market where it got exposed, people ate it, they knew that it was a very good product. That was the best part, but it was tough. We were calling people up, you know, restaurants, point blank, asking them, you know, telling them about our product and they really knew nothing about it. Katie Stonington says her favorite aspect of the farm is knowing it provides the community with safe, locally grown products. Furthermore, Dr. Stonington talks about challenges in the business. The weather can be the most difficult thing about raising grass-fed cattle. When we have a drought, I, I cannot feed grain, so I can't supplement and with grain, and so I have to figure out what to do. And so a lot of what I supplement with is uh, alfalfa pellets, and these alfalfa pellets are expensive, so they really uh, cut into my uh, revenue. But I got to do what's right for the, for the cattle. The Stonington family and full-time ranch staff believe in managing a healthy, stress-free herd. They handle the cattle daily and simply use voice commands to gather the herd for pasture rotation. Dr. Stonington's daughter, Grace, and son, Christian, talk about their roles at the farm. A few times every month, we um, vaccinate the cows, and then usually on the weekends, I usually work out. I mean, I do stuff on the farm. Um, my dad and I, we, and some of my brothers, we ride around and we work the cows, we move them in, into different fields. Some of the fields get eaten down pretty fast by the cows, and so we have other fields that weren't used by the cows. And so once the other fields were, you know, take, were eaten by the cows or most of the grass is gone, then we move them to another field. I cut hay, I fluff hay, I drag fields, I drag seeds in, I uh, sometimes spread I uh, um, spread out lime and I uh, spread seeds out and I halt to break calves for showing and I put hay out. I work herds of cows. 
I vaccinate them. I move cows with my dad. Additionally, Christian shows livestock in 4-H, exhibiting cattle raised at the farm. In the future, the Stonington Farm family hopes to continue providing healthy, locally grown products at more locations in the state. From Perkinston, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. And you can watch this story again on Stonington Farm at our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also uh, have this available through twitter.com slash farmweek. We'll have the links and contact information where you can get in touch with Stonington Farm. And Leighton, uh, that uh, aired earlier this year, so we are got an update. Uh, the Stoningtons are now the only certified American Grass-Fed Association uh, farm for finished cattle in Mississippi. They're also in another upscale restaurant. They're now in Vicky's on Walnut in Hattiesburg. So, uh, and they're supposed to be expanding into more corner market store, corner market grocery stores. So things are uh, looking good for them and they're working hard and it's paying off. Certainly is. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, the Great Mississippi Tea Company. This unique Brookhaven, Mississippi operation is planting the plants which will become the base of its future sales. It plans to introduce mechanization into what is traditionally a labor-intensive crop. And the food factor will have some tips on eating out without blowing your diet. In Southern Gardening, see some plants that won't blow your gardening budget. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next year.